Hey, my name's Dan, and this video is going to be an introduction to Framer's layout system. We're going to talk about position, size, and layout, and how you can combine them to build pretty much anything. So let's just jump in. On the web, things are laid out in the document flow. And by default, this just sort of means that items stack one after each other, top to bottom. The position property allows us to control whether an element is going to participate in this flow or not. Framer gives us four options. The most common option is relative. This means the element will lay itself out however its parent tells it to. Most of the time, this is what we want. But when we don't want an element to participate in the layout flow, we can use absolute. This option means that instead of being laid out according to the flow, this element will position itself to one of the parent sides. Notice that when I set this, nothing really seemed to change. That's because Framer is being smart and setting the offsets so that the element stays in the same place. If I change this offset to zero, change this offset to zero, we can see that the element docks to the top left of the parent container. If I preview that, we can see it a little bit more clearly. The next option we have is fixed, but you'll notice that it's hardly ever available. Now, Fixed works the same as absolute, but instead of being positioned relative to the parent container, the element gets positioned relative to the first element in the tree, which in our case is this desktop frame. In Framer, this option can only be set if the element is a child of this desktop frame. We can now set its position to fixed. Once again, Framer set the offsets for us. So if we set that to zero, that to zero, and that to zero, and preview that, we can see that this element sticks to the viewport no matter what. This is really useful for fixed nav elements, for instance. The last option we have is sticky. Now, this is a little bit weird. By default, the element acts as if it has position relative set. But if we scroll down to the top, we'll notice that it sticks to the nearest parent element that has a scrolling context, which for us right now is this desktop frame. Once the parent element is scrolled out of view, it stops sticking and we carry on scrolling. We can also set an offset here. So if I change that to 40, you can see that once I scroll down, there's 40 pixels of offset between the sticky element and the scrolling element. One thing to note about position sticky is it only works if all the parents of that element have their overflow set to visible. If I set this to hidden, and make this really long and preview that you can see that even once we hit the top of that element it doesn't stick if i go back and set this to visible and preview it again it sticks so next up we need to talk about sizing if position is how an element places itself in the document flow size dictates how the element sizes itself in the available space we have four main options, fixed, relative, fill, and fit, which is cut off a little bit here. Fixed is the easiest to understand. You just set a fixed size in pixels. Fill takes up the available space provided by the parent, which means if the parent's width changes, so will the child's width. If I preview this and we change the width of the document, you can see that the width of number two changes to match. Fit content takes up as much space as the children or content need, which means if the size of the contents change, so does the size of the element. So if I select number two and I change its contents to be a really long string, you'll notice that the width of the element changes to match. Relative takes up a percentage of the available space provided by the parent, which again means that if the parent width changes, so does the element width. If I set this to be 50% and I preview this, you'll notice that number two always takes up exactly 50% of the available space. The last option we only have available to us on height, and that is viewport. This sets a fixed height based on the height of the window. 100 VH means take up 100% of the height of the window. So if I preview this and we scroll down, you'll see that the element takes up exactly 100% of the size of the window. 
I make it smaller, you can see that the element adjusts its size. This is really useful for things like modals, where you always need the element to take up the whole screen. One of the cool things about Frame is that we can add min and max values. If I set my element's width to be relative, let's say I want it to be 50%, I can also set a min width to make sure it's never less than 200 pixels. So if we preview this, notice that once the overall width of the container goes below 400 pixels, the width of our element sticks to be 200 pixels. Just for the sake of it, we can also add a max width. So let's set this to be fixed and we'll make it 600. Now when we preview it, you'll see that the item stretches until it hits those two limits. Okay, so let's talk about layout. Where position and size dictate how an element itself should behave, layout dictates how the children of an element should be laid out. Framer gives us three main options for layout, and the first option is actually sort of none. If I select this container and remove its layout property, you'll see that not a lot really happens. And that's because Framer has set the position of all of the children to be absolute. So I can just sort of, you know, drag everything around inside of the container. If we reapply layout, you'll see that by default, it's set to stack. This means that items are, well, stacked, one after the other. But we can configure quite a lot on a stack. We can change the direction from horizontal to vertical. We can also change the way items are distributed within the stack. Now we have a bunch of options here. The first three are going to align the items to the start, center, or end of the container. Notice though that the start and end change depending on the direction of the stack. When the direction is vertical, the start is on the top and the end is on the bottom. When the direction is horizontal, the start is on the left and the end is on the right. We can also, of course, put them in the center. One thing we should note is that we can control the spacing between these items by controlling the gap property. Whereas if we use one of the space options, the spacing is calculated for us. Space between leaves no spaces at the edges and divides the space evenly between the items. Space around makes sure that there is exactly half the amount of space at the edges that there is in between. And space evenly makes sure that the space is distributed evenly around the edges and in between the items. Now, one thing you might notice is that these spacing options are very useful if our width is set to fill. Because our options are taking up all the available space, our spacing options aren't having any effect. In fact, start and end don't seem to matter either because the items are stretching from start to end. That brings me neatly onto the subject of layout collapse. Now, if I switch this container from fill to fit content, you'll notice that these children have switched from fill to fixed. This is to prevent something called layout collapse. Basically, if the children are trying to fill the parent, but the parent is trying to size itself based on the children, everything will collapse down to zero. Now, Framer tries to automatically avoid this situation for us by switching things from fill to fixed, but it can be confusing when things change automatically. Sometimes Framer warns us, so if I set the children back to fill, you'll see we get a little error message telling us that it set the parent container to fixed to avoid layout collapse. Anyway, there are a couple more stacking options we need to talk about before we move on. We can set the alignment of items within a container. Notice how these options change if we change the direction of the container. Lastly, we can tell the items to wrap if they run out of space. By default, if they run out of space, they'll just sort of overflow the container. But if we set this option to wrap and preview it again, you'll see that they wrap to a new line, which is super useful. Okay, so that's everything to do with stack. Now we need to talk about grid. With grid, the items are placed into columns and rows. If we click in here, we can see that by default, the columns are set to auto and they match the size of our items. If we select one of our items, we can see that their width and height was changed to fill, but now we have these column and row span options. Now I can set how many columns each item should span. We can also change our column width from fixed to min. 
This will make sure that the column takes up all the available space, but never gets smaller than 200 pixels. Alternatively, we can set a fixed number of columns and rows if that's what we want. I can adjust the number of columns here or the number of rows down here. Framer will always make sure that there's enough columns and rows to accommodate all of my content. If we decrease the number of columns, the number of rows increases to accommodate. So that's pretty much it for the basics of layout in Framer. I think you can see that if you combine position, size, and layout, you can create really complex and dynamic layouts. If you found this video helpful, I'm making a bunch more beginner Framer content, so stick around for that. I'm also working on an advanced course for those of you looking to push the limits of Framer. There should be details to sign up for that in the description of this video. Until next time, thanks for watching.